Hello and welcome. Yeah. Hello and welcome to the Terran Files. I'm Jamie Young. Today I'm with Kimberly Davis, the current um, treasurer for Clinton County, and she is running for the Senate seat for our 45th uh, district, which was uh, held by Betty Little. And Correct. her opponent on the Republican side is Dan Stack. Mm -hmm. So um, let's start up. Um, you've been treasurer for the past few years. And before then, um, town assessor. Well, I was the um, branch manager at the Glens Falls National Bank on Cornelia Street mm -hmm. uh, before I was treasurer. So uh, my assessor job was uh, actually many moons ago, but um, so the most previous job to me being assessor or county treasurer for the last six years was um, as a bank manager. Oh, nice, nice. So you get to play around with money a lot. I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, you also, um, you know, I have a marketing degree in business and philosophy and minor in accounting, which does, I'm sure, goes a long way. Um, yes, I think, um, you know, we, you know, I, I saw your briefly a little bit about your with your interview with Patrick and uh, there aren't too many finance people in Albany, um, certainly in one of the most taxed state, if not the most taxed, it's we really need people in Albany who have an understanding of finance and budgeting um, efficiencies of government. And I think that's one of the things that I bring to the table is um, you know, the knowledge of how all of that works. Um, so I think, you know, having that financial background is going to be, you know, helpful um, to, you know, bring my experience to, you know, the table. So. Mm -hmm. um, currently, and this is just out of curiosity, with um, everything that's been going on, how has the county been handling it on a financial basis? Sure. Um, I mean, we were very lucky that we came into March in a very good financial position. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the county does an incredible job in spending taxpayers' money wisely, which I think, you know, is what we should all strive for in government. Mm -hmm. And so when we went into March, um, sales tax is our number one source of revenue in Clinton County. For some counties, it's property tax. Ours is the other way around. It's sales tax. Mm -hmm. And so when we were going into COVID, we were actually $1.4 million ahead of where we were last year. And last year was a great year fiscally for us with sales tax revenue. So in a sense, um, we were in a, in a good financial position going into this. We certainly, um, the last month that we reported, we were 862,000, give or take, um, off of what we were, you know, the year before, um, but we're still ahead of, of our projections. And, you know, that's, again, one of the things I talk about is, is having somebody who's used to dealing with, um, you know, budgeting. Um, even though I am a proud Democrat, when you come to finances and people's other people's money and, and people have their trust in you, you mm -hmm. have to budget wisely and according, um, accordingly, we tend to actually be, you know, conservative in our estimates. We don't ever want to um, tax people so much that we have huge reserves, which we don't, um, but because of our um, great management team at the county, um, we don't buy things that we don't need. And certainly during COVID, um, our cutbacks have been huge there. You know, immediately we instituted no travel. Um, mm -hmm. You know, unless you have something that is a COVID related expense, don't buy it. Um, we also communicated with our employees, with the management team, with the legislature. And unlike other, you know, municipalities, 
we did put people out on furlough, but it was a voluntary furlough. Mm -hmm. uh, and even figured out at what point people would make more money being on furlough versus um, being in the government. We had to cut our staffs by 50%, which was very difficult. Um, my department is a small department. And so to work at 50% um, was incredibly difficult. It was, in a sense, triaging things. Right. Um, our number one priority, of course, is to make sure our employees were taken care of, that they were paid that our mm -hmm. vendors were paid um, and everything else was, you know, what has to be done next until we came back to full staffing. So again, because we are, you know, very responsible with the taxpayers' money and we have a great management team at the county, um, we're still going to be hurting. You know, the federal government is not doing what it should in giving direct flexible aid to the states and governments, uh, local counties. That's what we need right now. And this is part of the problem I see both in DC and in Albany is the partisanship, the bickering back and forth. People are really tired of that. That's why politics tends to turn people off. True. In a sense, it's one of the reasons I'm running. Um, my opponent is incredibly partisan. If you look at his Facebook page, whether it's <laughs> once a week, it's, oh, the left is doing this, the left is doing that. Mm -hmm. And that's not helpful. Um, when you are elected to government, you are there to represent everyone. That includes people who don't agree with you, people who have different views than you. Um, and so for him to demonize one third to one half of the population he's supposed to be representing is, you know, it's uncalled for. Mm -hmm. And that's not how I operate. Uh, if you had gone on to my Facebook page a year or five years, maybe a year, three, five, um, before I started running for this position, I very rarely put overtly political things on there. Because I'm the treasurer, I get there, I get to that job, you know, running on a ticket. But once I'm there, I'm doing my job every day. It is not a political job. Neither was my assessor job. It's one of the happy reasons I have um, having had that experience in both of these positions. And so the reason I didn't put overtly political stuff on my page is I didn't want someone coming into my office and thinking I was going to treat them differently because they had an R next to their name and I'm a D. And that's what we've kind of forgotten uh, in this day and age is, is how to agree to disagree. Yeah, I agree on that. Um, but, um, it's not an if, but a when. We go back into like a shutdown. Would you support Cuomo doing something like that? Or would you want to work with him in his office to do something different from what he did earlier in the year? Well, I, as I've said all along, we need to be based in science, not on um, what we're all feeling. What we're feeling is um, with COVID uncertainty, um, we've never had to deal with anything like this before. If the doctors and the powers that be and the scientists, and this is what I mean, the scientists say the only way to avoid, you know, a, another huge spike where we have the huge number of deaths is to shut down, that would be the only reason, not because one or two or three people think we should. There has to be a serious scientific reason for us to shut down again. And that really should only be the only reason. And you know why I'm saying this is because our region, our area is sparsely populated as opposed to Albany, New York City, Buffalo, and those tend to be the larger outbreak areas, but also we'll be moving into flu season and all the uh, medical experts and scientists said, and have been saying that we could see a double whammy at that mm -hmm. point. Right. Right. So again, we need to continue doing what we're doing with social distancing and wearing our masks and washing hands all the time. You know, I know it's 
a huge concern for you know parents and teachers right now thinking about going back to school. How is that going to work with you know kids in such close proximity to each other? Um, so again, we we really have to look at the science um, mm -hmm. and and be smart about it. When you were talking about the different regions, you know, it reminded me of, of when this was all going on. Um, the regions were designed that Cuomo chose or the regional economic development uh, counties. And so were the North Country uh, in the southern part of the district, Warren and Washington counties were part of the capital region. Mm. And one of the things that we disagreed on was that he, he thought that, um, oh, well, maybe counties should be able to band together instead of they didn't want to be part of the capital region because capital was behind us in the phases. And so, well, you know, you can't join the North Country, then maybe Warren and Washington should be their own counties. And I said, okay, let's just go a step further. What if any two counties next to each other had a lower case breakout than two others surrounding them? Should they be able to form their own region? Should each county be able to be their own region? Then we'd have 62 different plans of action instead of you know, the ones that we did. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he kind of came back and said, you know, I didn't understand and that's not what he said, but he had put together this bill that said um, there should be no states of emergency statewide. They should all be county by county basis. Well, people who live in Glens Falls, which is Warren County, work, some of them work in Albany. And like you said, Albany had certainly higher numbers because there's higher population. So, there was no playbook for COVID. Certainly things were done wrong. Um, certainly mistakes were made. But, you know, overall, when you look at the fact that we were all dealt in just completely unknown situation, um, the nursing home uh, deaths were absolutely unacceptable. But when you, ha when you look at everything else, the way this happened, um, most people have been happy with the way that the governor, you know, dealt with COVID. And so, you know, when I said these things, my opponent again, you know, bashed me for, oh, trying to curry favor with the governor. The governor doesn't, I don't need to curry favor with him because A, I'm not in office yet. He knows who I am, sure. Um, but there are, you know, plenty of senators and assembly people um, who make decisions every day. It's not one senator or one assembly person that makes any, um, no one person makes a difference. It's why there's a group. Um, mm -hmm. But for him to insinuate, I was trying to curry favor with the governor for political points over life and death, death matters is just sickening. True, true, because even though politics can be a nasty and dirty business. It is. Yeah. Um, it's better not to go down to that level. Mm -hmm. Which is difficult sometimes. I mean, it's, I think one of the, there are many reasons people don't get into politics uh, and especially women. I was just at a women's suffrage celebration yesterday. And that's certainly a question I get all the time. Why, why don't more women run? And, and there's no simple answer. But I think one of the reasons, again, that I ran was it's hard to find anyone to run for any position because it is ugly, mm -hmm. but kind of the higher you go in, in the positions, there are less and less people who are willing to run. And, you know, I've been in politics for a long time. I've actually worked on this Senate race a couple of times, uh, either in a volunteer capacity or um, in other capacities. So I certainly have known the district for a long time, but, people don't want to run because of what you have to go through and the size of the district. It's the largest Senate district in the state. Um, but it is incredibly ugly. And that goes back to what I was talking about with partisanship. Um, my brother called me one day and uh, we were on the phone and talking about something else. And he said, oh my God, have you looked at your political Facebook page today? And I said, no, why? He said, you would not believe what this person said. Well, I'm kind of used to it because you have to be. Mm -hmm. Well, what did it say? And he said, they said they should, people should vote for your opponent. 
I said, really? That's the most vanilla thing I've heard all day. <laughs> said, Let me send you some screenshots of some really ugly things that people have said. And, you know, I think that's certainly a social media problem too, but people think that because you're running for office, they can say anything they want and you have to take it, um, which is absurd. But instead of just scrolling on by, if you don't agree with something, um, I'm a Nazi, I'm a communist, I'm um, a fascist, I'm a baby killer, I'm a libtard, I'm, you know, I can go down the list and some things yeah, I can't yeah. say, but, yeah, you know. Yeah, I, I get that. Uh, male candidates, not so much. Female candidates in those of color tend to get the worst of everything. The interesting statistic, because I am a, a numbers person, is my Facebook followers on my political page are 60-40 female, 60% female, 40% male. When I put up an ad, which is targeted to people just within the Senate district, I use it by zip code. When I put up an ad, my trolls, my negative comments are flipped the other way. Um, and it's not 60-40 anymore, it's more 80-20 or sometimes 90-10. Um, so yes, it is a another one of those negatives of of politics. Mm -hmm. But um, oh, moving along. Um, your feelings on how the environment and the current um, project, uh, Durkee Street project, is. Uh, going to impact our our uh, area so i'll split those two so on the environment um you know we have an incredibly beautiful area here and it's why people come to vacation mm -hmm. and for some people it's why they actually come to either retire here or relocate here and um it is incomprehensible to me that um, my opponent voted against the climate change bill last year um, and he, you know, chairs the environmental committee. It's just um, mind boggling how, um, you know, and his, I believe, reason was it's too expensive. Well, it's going to be too expensive when people don't come here because we have acid rain again or, you know, any of the myriad of things of, of what was in the climate change bill. Um, so it's just unbelievable to, unbelievable to me that he would, he would have voted that way. Um, the DRI, so I will, you know, kind of pass the buck a little bit. Um, no, I, 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 I'm just looking at your personal opinion, not, not, not anything. Well, my personal opinion is I don't live in the city. And so it doesn't, I don't have it. It's not a direct impact on me. Mm -hmm. What I would say is with any DRI across the state, I think there has to be, I think this example of the city of Plattsburgh has shown us that there needs to be more oversight um, with the state, as I understand it, and, and again, I don't live in the city, that um, there are people that state that the original project as it was written or the original grant application as it was written has been altered, changed. Um, I certainly remember the statement that the apartments that were going to be there were going to be um, affordable and not in the term affordable housing, but affordable for the, the average person. Um, and the latest number I've seen, those are high-end apartments. Mm -hmm. um, and people who are paying those kinds of rents um, in our region are tending to get um, very nice atmospheres around them. Um, you know, certainly I haven't seen all of the details of what these apartments are going to be like, but I just think the the costs that I've seen for those rents are incredibly high. And I can't imagine that the occupancy rate is going to be full. Mm -hmm. And then of course the, the issue, I understand schools, city school district problem with, um, you know, the pilot and all of a sudden there'll, there'll be more kids in the school district. Um, and whether that was ever calculated properly, but, um, Again, I'm not an expert on the prime project on the DRI, um, but I do think that if it's since it's state money, that there should should be more state oversight into it, so that there wouldn't be all of this um, 
animosity and, and problems that have arisen because of um, the different sides looking at this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it's uh, going to affect so many people. Yeah, and most people, seeing that they are looking at more high income, most mm -hmm. people in the city can't afford that. Right. Yeah, I, 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 of the numbers that I have seen, those rentals are not for the average person. And living in Burlington, over time, rents increased and increased. Mm -hmm. So where a typical one bedroom apartment in Burlington can easily go for twelve to fifteen hundred a month. Mm -hmm. Well, my other concern is that the um, retail space that they're supposed to have, um, you know, there's retail space across the street from where Prime is supposed to be that, as far as I know, has has not been fully occupied in years. So why is bringing more in? Um, again, I'm not. I'm trying to look at both sides, and which is what I do. Anytime I have, you know, two different arguments coming at me, um, I just I hope this gets settled in a good way because it it can have um, serious consequences for, you know, the entire city. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true, true, true. Um, one of the topics that uh, Patrick and I talked about is uh education and training mm -hmm. um what things or what ideas do you have focused around that well i think one of the things that um we need is education that's affordable um you know back in you know i'll go one generation before my parents generation it was much more affordable to get a four-year degree um, my parents could not afford to send me to school. Um, I paid for it myself and I'm still paying for it. So, um, you know, I was 10 years older than everybody when I went back to school, but, uh, I'll be, let's see, 46 in 10 days and I'm still paying back my student loans. It's an incredible burden, um, to bear and it, it's, it's has to be more affordable. We have to figure it out the but not every student needs to go to college um there are great paying jobs in the trades and i think we need to make sure that younger people today understand that you can have a great career um in the trades um it's it's i don't think it's promoted enough i think that um we need to make sure that in our contracts of um you know, public works that were providing apprenticeship training. Um, there's so much that can be done to improve um, all kinds of training, not just college. True. Um, would that uh, training also be part of uh, green energy as in solar, wind? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, the, Clinton County has done an incredible job coming back from the base closure and becoming now a hub of manufacturing. When people talk about manufacturing countrywide, oh, you know, that doesn't happen anymore. We have great manufacturing here and, and we've become, you know, this transportation hub for manufacturing. So, you know, we need to go towards green energy. Let's start having green manufacturing jobs. Um, you know, when you look at Clinton Community with the Institute for Advanced Manufacturing, um, that is a great facility that we could train people on, you know, green manufacturing jobs. Mm -hmm. but, um, another thing that uh, has been discussed, and this has been statewide and nationally, is to have higher learning free for all residents. Hmm. Would that be something that you would go along with or? I think um, I'm not necessarily for a free four-year degree. Um, I believe 
certainly uh, up to the community college level um, and or more incentive for jobs that that we need and are always struggling to fill. Um, when you look at the you know shortages we always seem to have with with nurses with people in the healthcare facility or healthcare field. Um, you know, putting more incentive into coming and in, going into those fields. So, you know, I don't know that um, free four, four year degree, because, you know, if we're talking about people paying, paying their fair share, which I do, you know, I do believe that there should be um, more millionaire and billionaires tax. Um, no one makes it on their own without uh, public infrastructure. Um, you know, it's talked about quite often that, you know, if you build a factory and I did this all myself, well, you use public roads, you, your workers went to public schools, um, you know, paying your fair share. And, and I'm not saying, you know, pie in the sky, but um, I think that if people can afford to send their children to school, if you're making $50 million, why should your child go to school for free? You know, those, there has to be some kind of, I, I believe, um, income cap. And, you know, one of the things I talk about with different areas is we have very different regions in New York State. The North Country is very different than Rochester, than New York City, than Long Island, and even than Albany. And so um, when you're talking about money, we also have to look at it regionally. So for example, something that's in my wheelhouse, um, like if you take the star exemption that people get for, it's in your primary home, it's for your school taxes. Mm -hmm. The income limit on that is $250,000. Well, that's good money <laughs> in the North Country. In yeah. New York City and Long Island, it's still good, but when you have two people working, professionals, that might be their income and they're no better off than somebody maybe in the North Country making 30 to 50 percent less because things are more expensive where they live. If your rent or my rent is a thousand or fifteen hundred, their rent might be or mortgage um, might be two or three thousand dollars. So we we need to sometimes stop thinking of a one-size-fits-all. So in this case with college, um, you know, like I said, I think two year is is fine, but no matter what, there has to be um, some common sense caps on that um, for income. Um, say two years free, you go for a fourth year, some kind of uh, service related mm -hmm. to pay that off. Right. That's been done in the past, and it's been very successful. Right, absolutely. And the military does it all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's look at the jobs that we need, and you know, to encourage people to go into those fields. Absolutely. If you're going into these fields, your third year is free, or your third and fourth year is free. Um, but we've we have to go back to not making higher education such a burden on people. Um, it's, it's just, it's drowning our young people and it's, it's hindering them from being able to um, buy a home. I mean, how many people in the millennial generation are putting off buying homes now? You know, it used to be, that was the standard American dream. You, you went to school and you bought a house. Um, people are, it's slowing down. That, young people aren't necessarily buying houses. And that's because um, most of them getting out of college are burdened with a lot of debt and they end up unfortunately going into jobs or careers that they have no training in. Or like say an example being someone with a four-year degree in computer science around here. That is a hard job to fill because there's not that many available. What does the person end up doing? Going to work at Walmart. And even then, you don't make a good living. Well, let's use that example, and, and I'm not... Uh 
tech savvy by a whole lot of imagination here, but um, to pivot a little bit to a different subject, but related is those, you know, there's a, a complaints certainly from all kinds of, of folks, whether it's parents or politicians, because we need people here to, you know, the more people we have living here, the more property taxes we collect, um, the lower the tax rate for everybody. So one of the problems, of course, is the brain drain. So people go to school, but they feel either they have to take a job that is less than what they should be doing, um, or they leave the area to go work elsewhere. In the 21st century, that should not have to happen because there's, you know, cell and broadband. Um, but cell and broadband are, even though they're basic necessities in the North Country, we are not on equal footing as the rest of the state. You know, I've been talking about cell and broadband for years, um, but the it certainly came to even more of an ugly head during COVID when our students all of a sudden had to go to remote learning. Mm -hmm. I would get calls in my county office from parents saying, where can I drive my child so they can sit in the car and do their homework for a couple of hours where there's a public Wi-Fi spot? That is not acceptable. This is, you know, it's like electricity was in the 30s and 40s. This is not a luxury anymore. This is a necessity. Mm -hmm. And when during COVID, um, a lot of doctor's offices wanted to do telemedicine, which is great because in a lot of our rural areas, we don't have, you know, doctors. It's really hard to attract doctors here. Telemedicine is a great tool, but if you don't have broadband, you can't do that. Um, cell phone coverage. So this Senate district is 6,800 square miles. There are certain parts of the district I can drive for 45 minutes and not have a sales signal. These are not new problems. And, you know, my opponent was, you know, tooting his own horn that he co-sponsored legislation to do a study about why broadband is so bad. He's been in the assembly for eight years and all of a sudden now it's a problem. Um, this is not something that a lot of people know south of here. I've had conversations with um, people I know down in Long Island in New York City and when I talk to them about this issue, they just, you know, they're dumbfounded. Well, what do you mean? Like, there is no service. And it's just, it is not taken seriously enough. Um, this is just one of the areas where we have inequality in the North Country. And it's why it's important to have somebody um, in the majority to fight for that, because unfortunately, um, that's how things get done, or fortunately, but yeah, yeah. Um, something that also has been discussed is uh, universal health care. Oh. Um, New York has what you can kind of say something almost like that, but that's through Medicaid and Medicare. Mm -hmm. There are those that are looking at taking that and doing that universal. Mm -hmm. So if you want my opinion on that, um, go ahead. Health, healthcare is absolutely human right. It is not, it should not be tied to your job. Um, you know, look at all the people who are unemployed across our country. Um, who now don't have health care. The problem with it um, that I find in is New York versus the federal government. Um, I do believe that it, it has to be passed on the federal level. And a lot of people don't talk about the why when they say that, and I will, because again, I'm a numbers person, I'm a money person. The only state that has done true single payer is Vermont. And after three years, they got rid of it because they couldn't afford it. There are, the problem we have here is that in order for it to work, we would have to get a Medicaid waiver from the federal government. And it, when you look at Donald Trump's relationship with Andrew Cuomo, that's not going to happen. So if we don't get that waiver, there is no conversation even to having, you know, the, the New York Healthcare Act. Um, when you also look at 
the commentary by New York State Controller Tom DiNapoli, who is incredibly well respected, if the top numbers guy and money guy in New York State says, this is not financially possible, I have to respect that. So yes, I absolutely agree. Healthcare is a universal right. It's gotta be done on the federal side. We, it's cannot, on its current form, I don't see it happening in New York State. Okay, seeing that you're a numbers person, how would you propose something that would work? I don't have that answer. You know, I, I will, I'm one of those people that will tell you if I don't know something, I don't know something. And I wish more politicians would do that. But um, I, I have yet to see a state solution to this problem, which is why I have said it needs to come from the federal government. So something that Bernie Sanders has been crusading, if it mm -hmm. ever was to come to pass, would be something acceptable to you? Absolutely. Yeah, I, like I said, I'm, I'm absolutely for everyone having health insurance. Um, it, it's, it's not, you know, so many other countries around the world can do it. We certainly can figure it out. Um, but I, I don't think 50 different solutions is is the best problem or best way to solve it. Um, and certainly under the constraints that we are under um, currently in its current form, um, at this point, I feel the only way it can work is on the federal level. Um, during the Democratic primaries, mm -hmm. Andrew Yang, he started a whole thing of the universal income. Mm -hmm. He, from his wealth, he gave to, and he still is, giving to certain people a thousand dollars a month. Mm -hmm. Recently in Congress, and there's been some kind of mentioned around the state about trying to do some kind of universal income. Down in DC, they're saying more like 2,000 a month. Would you support something like that? And if so, why? I'd have to see if, if that's going to happen, would there be anything that they'd be taking away? So if all of a sudden we all get $1,000 or $2,000 a month, would they, the government, whether it's the state or the federal, say, okay, we're giving you this, but there's no more social services. There's no more um, this program or that pr program because now you should be able to pay for it yourself. Um, so I think that <laughs> this case specifically, the devil would certainly be in the details. I do understand, you know, the, there is a, you know, something that makes sense financially in uh, UBI. When you look at um, how much it costs to provide things like, you know, I know a lot of people don't think like anyone who shows up at the hospital, they have to take care of them, whether they have insurance or not. And so one of the topics that's come up, you know, with healthcare is, um, you know, if it's ever free for all or um, in, I'm sorry, well, let me change to housing for a second. When you house someone versus um, someone who is homeless, um, when you give them, first of all, just that dignity, but also um, give them other tools to get ahead is actually cheaper than having them be homeless and having them constantly in the hospital or um, all, of the, all of the other services that can be required. So it would be looking at all of those different things, adding them up and figuring out, you know, if this is to work, what is the amount that would make the most sense that would alleviate other problems? Um, is it going to help um, the economy? Because obviously if there's more money in certain people's pockets, then they're going to spend it. Um, it's, it's, it's certainly a very interesting concept, um, but there's there would be a lot of details there to work out. Um, Robert Reich, Obama's um, labor secretary, mm -hmm. he did a video about the whole subject and what he proposed, and this was his whole thing on 
the difference between a control society and a society that works for the people. And mm -hmm. that's to try and level that playing field mm -hmm. where those at the top percentage are taxed at a fair rate. My guess would be closing up a lot of loopholes within the IRS mm -hmm. as So, um, yeah, I mean, there's, you know, again, if you look at the state level, um, look at the New York State Department of Taxation and Finance. They have auditors who go and audit people's tax returns, which nobody ever wants an audit. But um, one of the things I'm, I'm looking into right now is for each auditor, and I certainly know there are a lot of different levels. Um, and I'm, I'm using fake numbers, these are not real numbers, but if an auditor makes $80,000, let's say, and in their job auditing, um, they average a bringing back, you know, if, if they're finding fraud, um, that they're bringing in a half a million dollars a year in fines and penalties, let's say. It makes sense to hire more auditors. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a proponent necessarily of, of big government because I know that's the first thing someone hearing this, um, you know, might say, but it's people who certainly have the means, yes, they need to be taxed more, not necessarily in, you know, rates we've seen before, but, you know, when I remember Elizabeth Warren saying something in the last year about, you know, in her kind of uh, progressive tax rate, it's, okay, maybe the tax rate whatever it was, I can't remember. Um, but it started at not if you make $20 million at $20 million, we're going to tax it 50%. But at $10 million and one penny, um, that's when this, you know, higher tax would kick in. There's, there's nothing wrong with making money. That's, you know, the American dream in a sense is, is to make a good living. Um, but everyone, going back to my example before, everyone benefits from um, you know, the streets and electricity and, and all of the things in a sense that the government supplies. So they need to make sure that they are also paying their fair share. Um, you know, it's not the typical line of, you know, oh, so other people don't have to work. Um, you know, that's not what our taxes are for. No, it's not. Um, but if you're making, you know, again, huge sums of money, um, $10 million, $50 million, $100 million, the, you know, the inordinate wealth at the top needs to come down and help out, you know, our, our fellow man. I mean, I said it in the um, arguments we were having during COVID about sharing ventilators. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we are a brother's keeper. That is my, you know, one of my philosophies. And, if we, we weren't using them, let's share them. Um, it's that very simple principle is, you know, there's only so much wealth that you can possibly use. I'm not saying let's go and, and tax people at 90%. I'm not, it's not what I'm saying at all, but um, we definitely have to, get, you know, the income inequality is just so incredible and in, in not in this country and in the state. So we need to, um, find and, that balance. And, and that plays into hand with the uh, educational disparity too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I just want to kick over to something. Um, a couple of years back, um, I don't know if she's still Secretary of the Air Force or not, knowing this administration. But um, I don't even remember her name, but she mentioned during this one meeting that the Air Force is expanding all its air wings by 24%. Seeing that, um, and this also goes back to uh, something that, oh, Mike Cashman said in an interview about the F-35, if, and this is if, 
a group of people were to come to you when you get elected and you take office to work on bringing the Air Force back to our area, would that be something that you would support? Well, there's a lot of businesses where the Air Force Base used to be, so A, it's where to put it. Um, you know, it's it would be, you know, we have such a proud military history here, um, and it's, it is an honor for all of the things, um, all of the history that we've had of uh, people coming and training here, um, you know, back in, in Washington's day. Um, so, I mean, if they ever wanted to build a base here, I, I, I have a hard time um, thinking that would ever happen though, um, with the amount of bases um, that have closed. Um, you know, it's, it's, it was certainly a, a huge economic boon to the area. We've done well um, utilizing that space and, and I believe the chamber says uh, that we have more people working here now than uh, on the base property than when the, the Air Force was here. Um, but just looking at how bases have closed over the years, um, I, I don't see that being realistic, but uh, if they came and wanted to have that conversation, absolutely. Yeah. Well, in my, in my conversations with um, some folks, in, um, retired and currently serving, um, the discussion has been always around Air Guard, Air Reserve, but um, one of the recruiters that I was talking to at one point mentioned what's called a mixed use facility, meaning active military sharing a civilian flight line. Okay. You know, um, talking with those that have retired, they know exactly where something like that would be put. The whole issue, property. Well, when you first said it, that was exactly that was my first mm -hmm. thought. Is 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 where? Right. You know, because if you're standing at the airport, looking down towards the south end of the flight line, that's where they said it, the best location would be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I there's there's no reason not to have that conversation if the you know Air Force or the powers that be um, in um, reserves or National Guard um, that wanted to have that conversation. Um, you know, I can't mm -hmm. imagine that they we wouldn't be welcoming welcome, welcoming them with open arms. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, but. Um... Oh, what time is it? Oh, wow. Uh, well, um, <laughs> yeah, it's almost nine. Um, uh, um, thanks for being on. Mm -hmm. um, like I told Patrick, win or lose, you're more than welcome to be back. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, take care. Thanks, you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.